Reasonable. Yes, this looks excellent. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I didn't get the nice new uh, 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 title slide that, uh, that Olga made. I uh, fi may fix that later if somebody sent me the PowerPoint. But anyway, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to discuss um, the, the CASA calibration model and scare all of you away with some math. Um, oh, crap. Why doesn't this work now? Yeah. So um, the CASA calibration system framework model is based on something that's called the measurement equation or radio interferometry measurement equation. Um, this was first formulated by uh, Hamacher, Hamacher, Brechtman and Solt uh, in the late 90s. Um, but there is a, a, a nice uh, review and reformulation by Oleg Smirnov that was published a bit more recently. And it basically provides a mathematical basis for the calibration of a radio interferometer. Um, and what's important here is that it fully incorporates polarization. Um, older approaches sort of swept the, the, the fine details about doing proper polarization calibration under the carpet. Um, but uh, the, the measurement equation nicely integrates that. So um, the idea is that what we're after is actually measuring the electric field at some distant source. And um, like most of us will know, um, if you have an electric field, you have two components um, we call polarizations and in uh, in VLBI, we typically um, use circular polarization where we have right circular and left circular polar, uh, components. Um, but uh, compact arrays probably usually measure linear polarizations where you have an, an X and a Y component um, or even a, a, a V and an H component if you, if you measure things in the frame of the the telescope. Um, the nice thing about the measurement equation is that it's agnostic of what particular polarization basis you choose. Um, although things are simpler in, uh, in circular polarization and that's not an accident uh, that in, in VLBI we, we observe that way typically. Um, so the idea is that um, the, the measurement equation says, okay, um, the, the voltages that we actually met, at, measure at the feeds of our telescope are essentially a, a, a linear operator on that electric field at the distant source. Um, and what we do in our correlator is then we take those digitized voltages and, uh, and calculate uh, correlation functions or um, as they call it in this formalism, the visibility matrix. So the visibility matrix is, is some average um, of the, the voltage of one station on your baseline and the complex conjugate of the, the, the voltage of another um, telescope um, averaged over a period of time and maybe frequency. Um, we can now, given that uh, that uh, those voltages are um, uh, linear dependent on, on the electric field, we can write that uh, down. I don't know, see, do you see my cursor? Probably not, is it? Yes, we do. Oh, you do, okay. So, here we write, that means that we can write our visibility matrix um, this way, um, where we call the part in the middle, um, we call um, the brightness matrix, which is actually what we're after because if we do 
naively, if we do uh, an inverse Fourier transform of that brightness matrix as a function of, of U and V, um, we get our image. Um, that's a bit of a simplification, but um, for calibration purposes, that's, uh, that's all you need to know. Um, and what we need to do to calibrate our, our data is to basically determine these Jones matrices for each individual antenna. Now, the idea is that this Jones matrix can be um, separated in different components. And um, there's a, a few different conventions to do this. The convention I've written down on this slide is what, uh, what CASA does. Um, and basically the ID, these, these matrices um, describe in order what happens to the signal um, between our distant source and um, our telescope or actually the, the electronics in our telescope. Um, basically, the assumption is that not much happens until uh, the, the electric, uh, uh, electric magnetic waves um, hit the, the troposphere of the Earth. Um, but that's, so that's the first thing that happens. Um, there's also a delay involved. That delay is, is pretty specific to VLBI. So if you if you look the equivalent material in the CASA documentation, you it typically leaves out the K because it's not so relevant for, for other arrays. Um, that delay may actually be a delay introduced by the troposphere, but it, uh, it can also be uh, a delay uh, introduced by position errors of the, of the telescopes. We simply don't know accurately enough where our telescopes are. Um, then there's something we call the parallactic angle, um, which uh, um, for, um, for circular polarization is actually um, just a, a, a phase difference uh, depending how uh, the orientation of our uh, receiver is on the sky. For linear polarization, that matrix becomes actually a little bit more complicated. Then there is an, an, a matrix E that describes um, the optical properties of the telescope. And this is basically um, for most VLBI dishes. This is um, how the, describes how the dish deforms and therefore what the, the gain is, uh, relative gain is uh, when you have a little bit more, a little bit less of the surface uh, of the telescope that, uh, that uh, collects the signal. Um, typically is, is a function of elevation and it typically the effect is bigger if your telescope is, is bigger or floppier. Um, then there's uh, the D terms, the D matrix, which uh, 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 describes the polarization response because it's uh, it's apparently very hard to build receivers that just pick up a single polarization. There's always a little bit of the other polarization that leaks in. Then there's the, the all the electronics in the telescope uh, described by a matrix G. And then as Benito has said, okay, the electronics also have a certain frequency response that means that our band passes aren't flat. So that needs to be corrected as well. Um, it is important to realize that CASA always applies these corrections in the same order. Um, that means that if you do a tropospheric calibration and are tasks to do that, um, they always will be applied first to your model or last to your uh, uh, uncalibrated visibilities because yeah, it was V is J times E. So the E, which is what we actually want to measure is on this side of the equation and the V, 
the visibilities that we actually have, have uh, recorded are on uh, the, the left-hand side of, of the equation. And these operators can either, depending on what you solve for, and say if, you, if I want to solve for the polarization uh, response D, I need to apply T, K, P, and E to my model. And G and B, if I have already calibrated them to my visibilities in order to, uh, to be able to solve, find the matrix D here. So most of these, these terms have calibration tables in CASA associated with them. So the bandpass table for B, a gain table for G, polarization calibration table for D, a gain curve table for E, um, fringe fit table for K, and, uh, and if you do the, the tropospheric calibration, uh, important for high frequency usually, um, the matrix T, but because uh, the matrix P, the, the parallactic angle correction is purely a geometric effect that gets always calculated on the fly. There's no calibration table that you need to make uh, for that. So, um, like I said, these calibration tables in CASA um, represent these Jones matrices. Um, a calibration table is uh, uh, a directory uh, like the measurement set on, on disk uh, that contains the, 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 the data in, in the table and has an identity. It knows which, um, which matrix in the measurement equation it, it describes. Um, typically, it contains either complex or real parameters that are used to calculate these Jones matrix tricks. Um, but um, some of these Jones matrices, they're two by two matrices, but the elements in the matrix um, are not always all present. For example, a, a gain calibration Jones matrix is a diagonal matrix that simply multiplies the right and circular, right circular polarization and the left circular polarization by a single complex number. Um, and uh, so, so the, a, a G type calibration table has two complex parameters, one for each polarization. And when you create these calibration tables, you can, you can choose the directory names or the file names for these tables yourself. So it's possible to give them meaningful names. And one of the conventions that you see is you use the extension, for example, dot thesis for something that has thesis calibration, something gcal for something that's a gain calibration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to go back to this uh, measurement equation for a bit, um, because I remembered, I now said some of these matrix are diagonal. And the nice thing about diagonal matrices is, is that they commute, which means that matrix A times matrix B is the same as matrix B times matrix A, which means that for a lot of these matrices in this equation, it doesn't actually matter in which order you apply them. Um, however, uh, matrix D, the polarization calibration, is not a diagonal matrix. Therefore, it does not compute with, commute with the other matrices. And therefore, you can't move the gain to the other side of the D. Um, and if you are doing linear polarizations, the P, the, the polar parallactic angle correction, is also not a diagonal matrix, also does not commute, and therefore can't be moved um, as well. Um, you don't have influence on this yourself, but it does mean that it doesn't really matter whether you solve for G before you do the gain, before you do the band pass, or do it the other way around, whereas it does matter that you do the polarization calibration at the right stage. And some calibration strategies um, depend on the fact that you, you try to do a first an estimate of the, of, the, of the G matrix to do 
then a better job at, at doing your polarization calibration. But then after you've done the polarization, an instrumental polarization calibration, you go back to do another round of G, throw, throw away your old calibration and replace it with a new better calibration. So you can sort of develop iterative, uh, uh, iterative schemes to do your calibration, which is something that is somewhat more difficult in apes. Anyway, these calibration tables are the equivalent of an SN table in, in apes, as in that they store solutions of solving for a particular effect. Um, but CASA does not have the equivalent of an APE CL table. So in APEs, the CL table is, or the, the calibration scheme is that you, you, you solve for something, then you run CL CAL, which takes the solution, interpolates it and puts it on a, on a regular grid, and then adds it to your, your previous calibration. So you build up the CL table and you only when you, you actually want to calibrate your data, apply the latest version of your CL table. In CASA, it doesn't work like that. You only have the solutions and you ha always have to specify exactly what solutions you want to apply to your data. Um, how do you do that? Well, the CASA calibration table uh, tasks uh, usually take a, a a parameter called game table, which is a, a list. And this is the Python syntax to create a list. Um, this is a list of two uh, calibration tables, but you can add as many as you want. And um, they, uh, they provide, uh, so you provide the names of the calibration tables that you want to apply. So if you want to, um, to solve for say, um, the band pass first, then you first uh, pass an empty list and it will solve for the band pass. You create a calibration table, then you solve for the, the game, sorry. But you want to solve for the game with the band pass applied. You will now um, give a list with only one calibration table, the band pass calibration that creates another calibration table. If you now want to fringe fit with both the game and uh, the band pass applied, you now have to pass a list that has two elements, the band pass and, um, and, and the game calibration. It doesn't really matter in which order you, you list those, those tables because CASA always applies them in the order uh, that is right physically correct in the physical sense that describes the physics. Um, okay, you can um, selectively apply calibration by specifying the game field. Say you've, you've got a calibration table um, that's all for the band pass on a particular, uh, uh, on, on, on a few sources, but you say, okay, I'll, I'll actually pick 3C84 as my as my calibration, uh, 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 my bandpass calibrator, then you can specify um, that the name of that source in the same position as the bandpass calibrator. So it is, in that sense, the order is starting to matter because field one here corresponds to what data from calibration table one. You take field two applies to what data you take from Cal table two. Um, since there's no CL Cal that you run to describe how you interpolate the solution to the, the calibration, um, you can also specify how you want to interpolate. Um, CASA has a few options. The, 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 the most important ones are linear which is a linear interpolation between points in your calibration table, usually times, and, uh, and there's nearest, which simply picks the closest. Um, and again, the interpolation method has to be listed, methods have to be listed in the same order 
as the calibration tables. So if you say you have a bandpass calibration and you want to pick the closest here, you put nearest in the first element of the, of the list. And then the gain table, you want to linear interpolate that, you say in linear in the second one. Um, I'm pretty sure confident that linear interpolation is the default for most calibration tables, but um, but it varies and, and the documentation will tell you to how exactly. Like I said, there's no calibration table for the parallactic angle correction, um, but you have to, you can turn it on and off. The default is off um, because that saves some time and, 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 and parallactic angle correction isn't all that important for um, um, connected element arrays, at least if you're not doing full polarization. Um, so for field BI, you will always, always, almost always want to turn it on. And it is important to actually turn it on if, you, if you're doing uh, uh, fringe fitting. Um, so, so remember to always do that. Um, it has been mentioned already before. If you have um, data in your calibration table um, that is flagged, and this is actually what I wrote down here is not entirely correct. If it's if it if it's absent and there's a, a a solution nearby, everything is fine. But if there's no calibration information for a particular source or for um, uh, or if it or, or worse, if the calibration is flagged, then CASA will automatically flag the associated data. Um, that flagging can be bypassed when applying the final calibration. Um, but it's difficult to bypass this without editing calibration tables if you want to use the calibration table to do another calibration step, which sometimes gets in your way. Um, also by default, CASA quite aggressively flex data that's partly flagged. If you have, for example, data um, and you, you flag uh, the left circular polarization, um, CASA will automatically also flag the right circular polarization because if you're doing proper polarization calibration, um, actually a single polarization is quite, isn't, isn't very useful. Um, but as VLBIers sometimes they uh, think differently. Um, sometimes we have antennas that, uh, that only provide a single polarization, but still provide quite a useful uh, input uh, for your data reduction and you want to keep that data. So as of CASA 5.7, there's now an option to tell CASA that you want correlation dependent flagging, which means that if you turn that on, set it to true, it will no longer flag, automatically flag the, the other polarization. So that's something, uh, something that's important to remember. If your data is perfect, then it shouldn't matter, but as we know, we'll learn tomorrow, field BI data um, is hardly ever perfect. So then a little bit over da on data formats. Um, Olga already described the measurement set. We're actually on version two of the measurement set. There is a version three in preparation that will help resolve some of the issues we have made flagging. Um, but this is the native data format of CASA, but it's also used by other, um, other data reduction packages. For example, the, the LOFAR data reduction software uses the measurement set. Um, there is the MacTrees package that has been developed by Oleg Smirnov um, to allow a lot of experimentation with different calibration methods that also uses the measurement set. Um, so this is starting to become a common data format for, for at least the new radio astronomy instruments. 
And the nice thing is that it also allows you to take software that isn't part of the CASA package and use it on your data. Um, AO Flagger has already been mentioned, um, but there's also WS Clean, which is an alternative for T Clean within CASA that does things slightly different and might provide interesting results. Um, then there are actually two different for data formats um, that we call FITS. The first is UV FITS, and this is basically what apes writes out so if you have data in apes uh, want to export it and read it back into uh, to casa that's the data format that you will use um, but for vlbi we actually um, most arrays use a data format called fits idi this is what evn uses but uh, also the vlba and other arrays that use defex at our correlator um, also, older field BA data is also in FITS IDI format. Um, all these three data formats uh, contain both the UV data, so the visibilities, but also metadata, um, things like gain curves or, or system temperature measurements. Um, but there is a little bit of a difference in, in how things will survive um, when you import them in, in CASA. Obviously, when you have a measurement set, you don't need to import anything and you don't lose anything. Um, typically, if you use UV fits and um, your data is not VLA data, you probably lose a lot of the metadata that you need to do your calibration. So it's, it's fine to do your basic calibration in APES and then export it and then do some final steps in CASA. But this is probably not a very good starting point if you want to do the complete calibration in CASA. Whereas FITS IDI is the, is the standard for VLBI data. Um, you, you can import it in, in CASA and do everything in CASA. Um, before you do that, um, it is still necessary to, uh, to prepare your data. Um, basically, what we need is um, we need to extract gain curves. Um, for the EVN, that's done by using so called ANTAP files. This is the, 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 the files that you use um, in APES to do your amplitude calibration for VLBI data. Um, and there's a, an external script, and you can find them here. Um, I think Ilse has also pointed them out already in the, in the instructions. And you can basically run that under CASA by passing it the NTAP file. And it will then produce a, a table that we will use later on in the, in, the, in the calibration. If you have VLBA data, it almost certainly already has the gain curves inside your FITS IDI file and you can extract them with uh, a second script. So, so do the first thing for EVN and most other VLBI arrays, do the second thing for VLBA data. Um, the nice thing about VLBA data is that it also has the system temperatures um, in the FITS IDI file. Unfortunately, EVN and most other arrays, that's not the case. So there's a, a second script that you need to run that takes the system temperature measurement sets for measurements from your NTAP file and attaches them to the FITS IDI file. Um, a small story about gain curves. The current version of CASA, um, or, or there's, there's different ways to express gain curves. You can, sometimes they describe how the voltage scales as a function of elevation. Um, sometimes they describe how the power changes as a function of elevation, and the latter is most the most common thing for VLBI BI arrays, but not for the VLA, which uses voltage gain curves. Um, and then there's differences in parameterization. You can describe it at zenith angle or elevation, or if you have more complex telescopes, there's even, even other formulations, parameterizations possible. Um, the problem is that the current version of CASA only supports voltage gain curves as a function of a zenith angle. 
Um, therefore, the scripts that I showed you um, have to convert the gain curve from the NTAP file or from the FITS IDI file into that form. The way the code does that is um, by simply sampling the, the, the gain curve at, at all angles and do a fit and, and, and then, uh, or, and then com convert, of course, the gain into, uh, from voltage to, to power and then refit it such that we have it in the right form. Unfortunately, gain curves aren't always well behaved. Um, the difference between voltage and, and power is a square root. And if the gain curve goes through zero, you have a bit of a problem. Therefore, in many cases, um, and what this actually means is that the gain curve that is stored in the end-up file or in the, in the FITS IDI file was sampled over a limited range. Um, so what we have to do when we, when we sample in refit, you have to, um, to specify a minimum and maximum elevation and only sample it between those angles and then fit it. Typically, if you start somewhere 15 degrees above the horizon and end something like 80 degrees, um, uh, the fit will work and you end up with usable, usable, usable gain curves. So here are some ex examples for EVN antennas. The, uh, the, blue, uh, the blue line is uh, an exact evaluation of the gain curve, which is a typically polynomial of a third or fourth order polynomial. And um, the green thing is then a polynomial fit, a third order polynomial fit of the same gain curve. And um, as you can see, for most antennas, the difference in the gain curve are small. And you can question whether the, the measurement error on those gain curves is probably larger than the difference you see here. Uh, anyway. Um, so uh, CASA 5.8, the next version of CASA will have some fixes. Uh, it will have better gain curve support. Um, at that point, you have you should not have to do anything for VLBA data anymore. And for the EVN, simply append the gain curve and thesis to the FITS IDI file, and you're done. So um, importing the data, um, if you have FITS IDI data, is done by import FITS IDI. Um, you have to give it the name of the measurement set you want to end up with, give it a list of FITS IDI files. And if you have a, a single one, it's easy. And um, you also probably want to give it a scan re-index gap um, because the scan information is not stored in the FITS IDI file. That has to be um, reconstructed. And basically the idea is that, well, you have a new scan whenever your source changes or whenever there's a gap longer than X seconds. And X is what you pass here and typically 15 seconds is a good, good value. Um, for EVN observations, you typically have multiple FITS IDI files for a single observation. You pass them in a list. Um, and then you have to actually tell um, import FITS IDI that these files belong to a single observation, set const ops ID to true, then it makes it a, a single observation. Otherwise, it for each different FITS file, it creates a new observation and it uses those different observations. It, it puts a boundary in between them for various calibration tasks, which if that boundary falls in the middle of a scan is probably not what you want. Um, it doesn't hurt to always pass this option, even if you have only one file. Um, this task applies certain digital corrections for the DIFX correlator, um, especially important for the VLBA. And it's the same correlations that uh, corrections that APES, APES applies when you use FITLOAD to load your data. Um, if you have UV FITS data, 
you can use the import UV fits file uh, uh, task. Um, but as I mentioned, that probably will lose some of the, the, the additional calibration tables that are attached to those files that you created in Apes. So probably what you want to do in Apes before you import data is first run split that applies all the calibrations and, and read in the, 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 the visibilities and don't rely on any other data, metadata in your measurement set. Um, for VLBA data, you need to normalize the amplitude based on the other correlations. Um, this is run done with the AC core task, which creates a G-type calibration table that you then need to remember to, to apply in subsequent um, calibration tasks. Um, this basically does what the task AC core in apes does. Um, but because CASA, you can actually select the bits of the, the, the data that you want to, to use to do this uh, calibration, which includes um, the, the spectral windows and the channels within that spectral window that you use to, 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 to calculate the correction. Um, it actually replicates what uh, most of the functionality that ACSCL does in task in apes, which is a relatively new um, new task in apes to do do this process a little bit better, taking into account bandpass shapes. Um, then you may want to do some a priori flagging. Um, if you have data from the EVN archive, it typically comes with a UV flag file where that flags at edge, um, edge channels and, uh, and times where we know the telescope is off source. Um, with this script, you can create a, 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 a CASA compatible flag file and you can apply that using the flag command task. Then, um, we can do amplitude calibration uh, as Benito will probably explain in more detail tomorrow. This is done a little bit different for VLBI since in uh, normal um, in a close, a connected element uh, array calibration, you typically observe a flux calibrator and use that to set the, the flux scale and calculate, calibrate your gains of your telescope. But um, for VLBI, um, there are basically no compact sources um, that, uh, that aren't variable. So flux calibrators basically don't exist. So you can, can't do that calibration. Instead, we rely on uh, measuring something called system temperatures at the telescope. Um, and um, um, you have to uh, then convert those to uh, your flux scale using uh, using an additional inf information that's also stored in the in the various tables. So we already extracted the table uh, with gain curves. Um, you can convert that into a proper ca calibration table for your experiment by using the GenCal task. You give it that file we produced with the external script. Um, the thesis information is already in your measurement set. So you can simply run GenCal uh, type thesis to produce the thesis calibration table. Um, both are again G type calibration table. So they, they just uh, adjust the gains and, and you can apply them by specifying the gain table keyword to subsequent tasks. Band pass calibration. Mark? Sorry, yeah. five minutes. Yep. Uh, band pass calibration. Uh, now, autocorrect this did, did a bad job here again. Sorry, this should be ref and. Um, you can, uh, you can uh, calculate a band pass table. Um, fringe fitting will be discussed by guess, but if you run it, there's a fringe fit task. Um, that produces a, a case style calibration table. Um, so then 
um, when you've done all your a priori calibration, um, you have to apply the calibration to your measurement set. Um, you have to list again uh, all the calibrations um, and the kind of interpolation that you want to have done um, to, to apply the calibration on your measurement set. It will create this corrected data column that we've talked about. And that basically amounts to a full copy of the data. So you need to have enough disk space to do that. Um, after that, you can then split the measurement set uh, for the different fields. Um, at that stage, you can actually do averaging in time and frequency if you want. Um, but you need to run it for every field that you want to image. Um, alternatively, you can use the MS transform task, um, which basically ends up running the same code. It's just a different interface that allows you to do some additional things um, that you normally don't need if you simply want to split out the individual sources, but might need if you want to do um, um, spectral line, frequency, velocity transformations um, in one go. Um, one slide about the differences from CASA 5 to CASA 6. As we already said, CASA 5 is Python 2, CASA 6 is Python 3. Um, the problem with Python 2 is that it is no longer supported. So you will, everybody in science and outside science is all moving their Python code from two to three and there's some, some nasty differences. Um, you can, um, uh, so, so my recommendation is to switch to CASA 6 as quickly as possible but the plot cal situation might be a reason to hang on to CASA 5 for a little bit longer. Um, but at some point, this will all go away and CASA 6 is what will remain. Um, if you use CASA 5, you can run the Python scripts under CASA using CASA minus C, whereas the, the benefit of CASA 6 is that it has proper Python modules. Um, you can simply import them and use them as normal Python code, um, which makes scripting things quite a bit easier. Um, and that's it. Wow, you took me by surprise there. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mark. <laughs> That was uh, indeed a lot of math, but I see uh, loads of very good questions popping up. So I'll hand over the floor to Benito to uh, go through them in some sort of order. Yeah, thanks. I will try to go in order, but it's a bit uh, complicated. But uh, so the first one is: Do you know if a scan rate index gap is equivalent or completely equivalent to the clean argument in apes? Um. um... I believe so. Um, there's this, um, how did it work in apes? Can, can you specify this using uh, fit load or is it when you run indexer? I think it's when you run indexer, isn't it? That you can I specify it. I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, there are some subtle differences um, between how it decides where a, a scan boundary is, but for well-behaved data, yes, it should be equivalent. Okay, then let's move to uh, with the measurement equation. Uh, how is the thermal noise accounted for or modeled? In the um, yeah, so this is done by a weight and a sigma column in the measurement set. Um, basically, your visibility start out with a sigma of one over the square root of two times the bandwidth times the time interval. Um, in fit, import fits IDI actually also takes the correlator weight into account there, because typically if you have two second integrations, but there's some data missing in those two seconds, you want to sca scale the two second integration time with the correlator weight, which is a number between zero and one, 
representing the, the, the number of samples that were actually taken into account uh, when doing the correlation. And all the calibration tables, um, when you apply them, um, they, um, they scale the sigma with the gain you apply. And that's how you keep track of the significance, statistical significance of your visibilities and take into account, and that, and that basically translates into, so the final sigma has some relation to the, the thermal noise you expect. Um, and uh, I must admit that I don't know how to extract that information at a later stage when you're imaging, but I suspect that the imaging tasks um, somehow can uh, can can give a give an estimate of the thermal noise based on the sigma that's stored in your measurement set. It's certainly what we did in 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 the EHT, uh, comparing um, um, the the Hobbs output and the CASA output. Uh, that we we took the sigma and compared it to to the calculate converted that to in in into a thermal noise equivalent and compared that with the, the hops information okay thanks and there's there's a in the casa documentation there's a whole section about weights are you how how weights and sigma are are calculated and used yeah okay um following that uh well, you mentioned the parallactic angle correction, mm -hmm. but the parallactic angle corrections that in CASA needs to be applied with the flag, with the parallax through, and it's quite critical in BLBI. So can you emphasize why it's critical and or needed in all game calls, calls that you need to use? So, so basically, uh, I think it's, it's geometry and basically, um, depending on the, the, the orientation of your telescope on the sky, and because the Earth turns, that orientation changes with time. Um, but it, it basically, um, and then the orientation of the, the dish on the sky is called the parallactic angle. And basically the Jones matrix associated that with that is that it introduces a phase shift that is proportional to the the parallactic angle. This is in, 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 in circular polar, polarization basis. Now, what this means is that you effectively have a modulation of your signal um, with, uh, with time. Um, and if you would um, do a fringe fit, which also basically is a fit that based on, on the phase of your visibilities, and you wouldn't do the, the parallactic angle uh, co correction, there would be some sort of sinusoid effect into uh, the fringe fit, which fringe fit can't solve for. So you have to take that up first before you do the fringe fit. And that applies to basically all the tasks that you need because you don't apply it in a single task as for example, fringe fit. So yeah. you need to keep track of yeah. those ones. So if you're, but if you're, if you're solving for uh, um, a gain, a, a, a real gain, so just an amplification of your signal within the electronics of your system, your telescope system, then because that isn't phase dependent, uh, it doesn't matter. So you could leave it out. But my recommending recommendation is for field BI, just always turn it on. I think part of the confusion here is that in APES, it's one of the first things you do when you write it into your solution table. Yeah. And then you don't need to bother about it anymore. And in CASA, you need to make sure that you switch yeah. it on in the tasks. Well, and, and that's one of the things that APES gets slightly wrong if you're doing proper polarization calibration, because um, that means you actually apply the parallactic angle correction in the wrong order in some cases. Okay, yeah. so many questions coming in still. So go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, this, so this might go on quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, is there any additional preparations to merge the steps and the scripts that you mentioned for the flag, 
basically everything that you incorporate and the TC is calibration into CASA, but they will be separated script. So um, maybe at some point I can convince the supports, EVN support scientists to start providing FITS IDI files that already have the calibration information attached, um, like the VLBA does. Um, then this gets a whole lot simpler and it will also be simpler for, for, for apes. Um, there's some slight complications with that because editing uh, that information becomes a little bit more difficult because the NTOP file is, a, is an ASCII file and you can simply load it in your editor, delete anything that you don't like and then uh, or fix things a bit up a bit and then apply it. And if you already have that in the in the measurement set, in the FITS IDI file, you have to make sure that it is absolutely correct um, before the data gets distributed, or at least correct enough. Which, unfortunately, for the EVN, isn't always the case, um, or at least it takes some time to get that right, and 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 that would mean that we release the data sometimes later. Um, but yeah, until we get that done, and for archival data, yes, you will always need to 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 perform those steps. Actually, following on that, do you know if for BLBA data, uh, do they have the a priori flagging? In yes. The same? You need to do it in the same way, or no? For the, um, in the IDI? Um, I'm. So I'm, I'm not an expert on the VLBA, um, but in principle, um, the flagging data that is in the FITS IDI file is, uh, is carried through into the measurement set. So you don't need to run that step for the VLBA. So currently for the VLBA, you only need to um, extract the gain curves. Okay. Then when you have multi-frequency observations, like X and X, S and X, um, how do you deal with those ones in fringe feed and the CASA calibration? So um, it is the, the measurement set will, will keep track of this all correctly. Um, you have to think what you do, but in, in principle, the calibrations that you do will always be applied to the right band. Um, there are some subtleties in the fringe fit task that Des will no doubt explain tomorrow. So maybe ask that question again tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> then we move to... Yeah, first congratulations from Miguel. Uh, it probably is more a comment than a question. Uh, so you mentioned that it can be useful to add some useful information. That it's a, it wasn't explicitly written in your slides, but the core the flag equals true must be used for VLBI observations that have antennas with only one polarization. Uh, um, because otherwise it gets removed in CASA. Yeah, so that that's a bit of a subtle issue. Um, it really depends how the data was correlated. Um, what happens for the EVN is that typically, if there's only one polarization, um, that polarization is actually duplicated in the other pole. So if the, the antenna uh, recorded only, only left, the data will have both left and right. And I'm not sure if but Benito can answer that probably if you actually flag the wrong polarization in that case. Sorry, if you flag the wrong polarization. Oh. But if if yeah. if the polarization, the other polarization has been duplicated um, in the other pole, then everything yeah. will work. But you have to realize that you're overcounting that station, so you probably need to do some scaling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
Um, so, may sun, may in some cases, you may have it flagged. So you may not have the data. If, if it flags, you, you no. indeed need to do the core that flags. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, if you have to run AC core, that's a problem. Hmm. Because okay. when the core depth flags parameter was added in 5.7, AC core was overlooked. So that will hopefully be fix fixed in 5.8. Okay, then two relatively small, uh, brief questions actually. Uh, is there a way to transfer the IPS CL tables to a CASA call table? Um, yes, there is. Um, it's not very well tested, but I have a set of Parseltom scripts. I think I've made them available at some place at some point. I'll need to look that up. Um, that basically take a CL table and create um, a couple of other ta uh, CASA, equivalent CASA calibration tables for that. So it is possible. Um, here is, um, I also have written a script that can extract flags from apes and create a, a CASA flagging table. Um, I haven't used the script myself um, recently, so I have to I have to dig them out. Yeah, let's say that it's not for production right now, but it may be possible. Yeah. And then uh, related to AC core, should an AC core be repeated after channel flagging? Because uh, channel flagging will mess up the normalizations in the visibilities, at least for antennas with less well-behaved bandpasses. So as uh, you are modifying those amplitudes, so um, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about, I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is that this is partly what ACSCL in apes is about, um, where um, the idea is that you basically do the AC core correction, but only take into account the, the descent of 75% or so of the band. Um, there is a, a, a VLBA scientific memo on this that I think is worth reading if you're uh, an expert on these sort of things and maybe translate in some recommendations on how to run AC core in CASA. Um, but um, yes, I think this is a, this is a bit of a, a, a support question um, for the VLBA. Um, but if you would do this in apes for VLBA data, yes, you probably should do it in CASA as well. Um, I think for now, I think I'm leaving any more questions. Wow, that's excellent timing. Um, it's, yeah. it's really good to see all this activity and engagement from everybody in spite of not being able to see uh, the people in person. And this is exactly what we were hoping for. So it's great stuff so far. So this uh, webinar will now be closed and we'll have a half hour break. So we start at a quarter to the hour. So that's uh, 3.45 UT. We will start again with the data processing session. I just put the, the link to that in the, in the MetaMost uh, general announcements. And uh, it will be a nice experiment to see how all these breakout rooms are going to work. Um, if not, there's very little you can do about it. Uh, so leave it to us, just start with the projects that you had in mind, uh, ask us the questions that you run into and we hope to fix all these breakout issues if there are any on the site. So we will see you in half an hour from now. Take some time, get some physical movement exercise. If you can stop staring, staring at the screen, coffee, tea, whatever suits your time zone and see you in uh, 30 minutes.